Hi everyone, this is Tim N2LCJ with a follow-up video regarding the Heathkit single banders. In the previous video I mentioned that we'd take one apart and show you exactly what it's made of and how easy these things are to work on. Well, let's start with the HW22. I think some previous ham put this sticker on there, so I left it. Anyways, this is the first design of the Heathkit single bander, and there are some changes between this and the A model. So let's take a look inside. As you can see, this thing is frighteningly simple. Well, it's simple when you compare it to newer rigs. Generally, when you restore one of these, um, you want to try and replace all the paper capacitors. Um, the, replacing them is fairly easy. I've got one here. Let's see if I can get you a better look. Let's talk about this one right here. And there's a couple here. And there's one down there. Now you'll notice that there are some capacitors that are still in the unit. Uh, the, this and this. These are generally very reliable. Uh, when you're doing a television or radio restoration, it's really important to replace all the capacitors. In this case, uh, these things haven't been run to death just like a TV or radio would, so they're generally good. Uh, I do intend to replace them at uh, my next capacitor order. I just keep forgetting. Anyways, uh, here are your finals. These are the 6GE5s that I mentioned in the previous video. Uh, I recommend one of these uh, as a first restoration project because this radio doesn't have a lot of the complicated setups that uh, a multibander would. For example, um, you don't have to neutralize these final tubes. There's nothing to it. Um, take a look at the VFO. <laughs> this is funny. Up in the top, look at that. There's only a couple gangs in this tuner. Once again, very simple. Now to restore one of these, basically, all you have to do is take your soldering iron, which in this case isn't heated up, heat up the pins, pull them out, push the new one through, and resolder. It takes a little bit of dexterity, but it's really not too bad. Beyond that, you've only got a few different controls, and these are outlined in the heat kit manual. Uh, for alignment, you've got this knob right here, and you've got this pot here. These coils generally are not touched, and they're factory calibrated, as I remember. Now you'll notice that there is a tube socket right here there's nothing in it that's designed for a crystal calibrator that's if you need something like that to calibrate the radio but let's face it when you've got a VFO that's uh, calibrated in this fashion you're not going to need to um, you also work with the assumption that the last time this was this was used or at some point in its life it actually worked so um, whoa. So we go with that. Um, now, you'll notice there's one electrolytic capacitor right here. General rule of thumb is if it's paper, replace it. It's usually the best way to do it. Um, the level of which you want to replace the capacitors is up to you. These disc caps, I've never seen one go bad in anything I've ever worked on. So those get left alone. Sometimes you'll get an out of tolerance resistor, but it's, especially on these Heath kit rigs, uh, you, talk, you hear people talk about it. I've never run into it myself. The other important thing is the grounds on this radio, chassis grounds, are actually underneath these screws up here. These screws always loosen up after time. Give them a tweak, make sure they're tight. Now. Let's take a look at the second updated version. This one is a Heathkit HW, 
HW32A. And this is a, uh, a 20 meter unit. There are a couple design differences which make this one superior in some ways. First of all, the mic connector is on the front. On the older models, it's on the back. You have to string the cord all the way around. A little bit more convenient. Secondly, and I don't know why they did this, I assume it was for purposes in the future, even though it's a 20 meter unit, you've got to switch for lower sideband and upper sideband. <laughs> Obviously you're not going to use 20 meter lower sideband. Number three, you'll notice that the finals in this case are shielded. I've never noticed any performance difference. And once again, we've got a similar setup. Uh, single capacitor here that I've replaced. There's a few inside that have needed attention, but generally it's a pretty good unit. Now let's talk about the hookups. Let me zoom this in. Okay, <coughs> you've got your speaker, which is an RCA jack, ALC, antenna. For some reason, they decided to put an RCA jack for the antenna. Works just fine. And this is for an external receiver. And again, here are some more adjustment controls. And uh, aligning one of these things and getting it on the air is pretty simple. Um, all you have to do is download the Heathkit manual and follow the instructions in the later part of the manual. Not a big deal. One thing, as long as I've got this one on the bench, I'll point out, here's your transmit receive relay. Just clean that. Generally, these things come to life fairly easily. Now, when it comes to microphones, this one is off an old Drake uh, crystal two meter unit that I, I picked up a while ago. Works fine. Anything with a 600 ohm impedance will work on these, on these units. So you don't need to spend the extra money for the Heathkit microphone. Now you look at this thing and you say, well, okay, great, but where's the power supply? Where's the, where's the transformer? Well, that's kind of another beauty that Heathkit designed. Let's grab a power transformer. Ugh. Got a little weight to it. This is the Heathkit HP23 power supply. I made them in several different variations. Uh, a, B, and C. Uh, this one is a B, and it's got a switch for low voltage, 250 DC, 300 DC. The 300 DC would be used in your multibanders like an SB101, SB102. These use a 250 volt DC. Um, in many of the um, ones that don't have a switch, there's actually a jumper underneath. So let's see what's inside. Oh, look at those big paper things. Okay. Well, these are 125 microfarad, 500 volt DC capacitors. Let's take a look underneath. I've actually replaced these capacitors with modern Nichicon components. I think it's important in these. Anything paper goes. But that's it, really. To connect the two, you've got an umbilical cord, and it looks something like this. Now they have kits on eBay to build these cords, and they're not very good in my opinion. Uh, this one is for this radio. You notice you've got the 11 pin here, and I think that's 11 pin on both ends. And the cord they give you is this really stiff stuff. Um, this one actually was partially shorted and I wasn't getting any type of uh, B plus to the radio so I'm, I have to repair it. I actually made my own but of course I don't see it and it doesn't look like I brought it near the camera but I just used seven wires because the, at least I think it was seven, the, uh, the other single bander has a different power cord on it. Both of them plug into here and you can kind of see the labeling for these different supplies. <laughs> Word of caution, you get one wrong, 
stuff smokes, stuff goes very, very badly. So make sure that you get your wiring properly done before you power it up. So once again, this is the, these are a lot of fun and you don't need a lot of uh, technical expertise to work on them, nor do you need a lot of tools or equipment. Once again, tube complement. Just about every hand that has a pile of tubes has a bunch of 6AU6s. I must have 40 spares of those. Uh, 12AT7, that gets a little expensive if you don't have one. Um, okay, let's see, 6EA8s, a couple others, and your dial bulbs. So if you're interested in getting a first project, something you built yourself or worked on yourself, and you can take some pride and ownership in knowing that you did the work, these are a great starting point. Seven threes, everybody, and two LCJ.